This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 52. Hi, I'm Carrie Oberbrunner, author of Day Job to Dream Job, practical steps for turning your passion into a full-time gig. Hey, if there's one thing I'm passionate about, it's the Read to Lead podcast with my friend, Jeff Brown. Essentialism means thinking more deeply about how we can really contribute and how we can really solve people's real problems, not just the thing they have reactively asked for. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful successful and inspiring authors. And now here's Jeff. Hi, and welcome to the podcast dedicated to your personal and professional growth. I'm so glad you're here. We sit down each week with a successful and inspiring author to talk about his or her latest book and their unique insights on leadership, personal development, career, marketing, business, or entrepreneurship. In this episode, we chat with New York Times best-selling author Greg McEwen author of the new book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. In today's episode, Greg will share some of the ways non-essentialism manifests itself, the core mindset of an essentialist, the three-step process involved in becoming an essentialist, and a lot more. Be sure to check out our sponsor, Blinkist. They create wonderful business book summaries that you can consume in about 15 minutes. Get the core ideas and key insights from your favorite business books that fast. You can try it out free for three days. And if you like what you see, get 20% off an annual subscription with the discount code READ TO LEAD, all one word. The place to go is readtoleadpodcast.com slash Blinkist. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash Blinkist. Use READ TO LEAD as your discount code and save 20% off an annual subscription. Greg McEwen writes, teaches, and lectures around the world on the importance of living and leading as an essentialist. He has spoken at companies including Apple, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Salesforce.com, Symantec, and Twitter, and is among the most popular bloggers for the Harvard Business Review and LinkedIn's Influencer Group. He co-created the course Designing Life Essentially at Stanford University, was a collaborator of the Wall Street Journal bestseller Multipliers, and serves as a young global leader for the World Economic Forum. Greg is also the author of the new and already New York Times best-selling book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. Greg, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Well, I thought we'd start off by defining essentialism, first of all, Greg, and share with us why it matters in in 2014. Well, first of all, we just have to think about what non-essentialism is, or the opposite, first of all. I mean, this is the experience that most of us really are familiar with on a day-to-day basis, where we feel stretched too thin, either at work or at home, uh, that simultaneously we feel overworked and underutilized. Uh, It's where we're busy but not productive. Uh, And it's where we feel like our time is being constantly hijacked by other people's agenda. This is sort of the norm of our time, uh, and essentialism is the antidote to that challenge. It's about a disciplined pursuit of less but better. To illustrate this a little bit, I I was hoping you wouldn't mind sharing the story you tell in the beginning of the book that led you to this obsession to attempt to understand why otherwise intelligent people make the choices they do and and the lesson that you eventually discovered from that. Well, this was one of the important inflection points looking back, and it was, uh, in a sense, a a very typical work week. Uh, My manager emailed me and said, "Uh, look, you know, Friday would be a very time, bad time for, for, for you to have a baby. My wife was expecting uh, one of our daughters. And I thought they were just joking. But somehow, all the way through the week, I still felt this pressure to be able to be there. And Friday uh, was, in fact, the, the day that my daughter was born and I was in the hospital. And instead of being able to focus exclusively on what was clearly the essential activity of that day, I was torn. And I was feeling this need to straddle it. And can I do both? And can I fit both in? And having studied disciplined decision-making and uh, and how to push back and empowerment, I said with all the conviction I could muster, uh, yes, 
<laughs> and uh, I went. And I remember after the meeting, my manager said to me, you know, the client will respect you for the choice you made. And I don't know if they did, but even if they had, surely I had made a fool's bargain. Surely I had uh, conned myself into believing that I could just do both and both would be okay. And somehow that would be the way to win. But actually, of course, it's not. And I learned, among other things, that if you don't prioritize your life, then someone else will. Uh, if you try to fit it all in, you won't end up with it all. Uh, you won't actually get it all. You'll end up with a frustrated, stressful uh, you know, experience in life where the essentials really don't get the focus they ought to. Well, that phrase really resonated with me as I read the book. If you don't prioritize your life, somebody else will do it for you. Uh, Greg says the pursuit of success can be a catalyst for failure. What do you mean by that exactly, Greg? Well, for 15 years, I have been obsessed basically by one overarching question, which is why is it that otherwise successful people, teams, and organizations don't break through to the next level? And there's all sorts of answers that people will typically give for this, you know, fear of failure and, uh, and comfort zone and all of these kinds of answers. But the answer that I found was that success is the thing that holds us back from breaking through to the next level. And I observed it in part watching and working with executive teams in Silicon Valley, where when they were focused on the few things, the right few things, it led to success, but that success breeded options and opportunities. And those things unintentionally undermined the very focus that led to success in the first place. Mm. And so I'm exaggerating the point in order to make it, but success can become a catalyst for failure. So this is what I mean by that mm. idea. Well, what are some of the ways, you've hinted at some, but what are some of the ways non-essentialism manifests itself in your estimation? Wherever you go, in any part of the developed world, at any level, in any organization, people are feeling this problem. And using Jim Collins' language for the problem, it's the undisciplined pursuit of more. And so you know, we all recognize it when you simply ask how someone is doing. And how often the answer is, oh, I'm so busy. Uh, you know, not, not only I'm so busy, I am drowning. I am so busy. And there's this celebration almost, that sort of backdoor brag mm. in the way we talk about this. Because busyness itself has become uh, an overvalued asset. It's like, a, it's like the, the busyness bubble almost. Uh, so we had the real estate bubble and we've had Silicon Valley bubbles and years and years ago we had the tulip bubble. And in all instances, it's an overvalued asset uh, that gains this sort of irrational exuberance in society. And when it bursts, we all sort of look around feeling very strange and stupid, really, saying, how did it come to be that we thought this thing was so much more valuable than it really is? And it's just the same today with busyness that busyness itself is an overvalued asset. We think of it as if it's an evidence of success, an evidence of importance, but really it is, uh, it, it's, it's stripping away the, the very things that we value mm. most. Well, let's now get to the core mindset, Greg, of an essentialist. Talk, if you would, about the power of choice and discernment and, and trade-offs. Yes, I mean, this is really what the core of, uh, the book is arguing is that we need not just a new skill set, but first a new mindset. Uh, uh, we need to challenge the assumptions of non-essentialism. So if I was going to write the manifesto for, uh, you know, a non-essential, busy, uh, often meaningless life, then I would write a few things. I would say, number one, you just have to do everything. <laughs> you just have to. You have to do everything. In fact, you know, it's funny because I was at LinkedIn recently and I had a lunch there with a group of people after I had uh, taught about essentialism. And one of the people that had uh, come to the lunch said that at the beginning of this year, she had actually set herself a goal to say yes to everything. Oh, wow. Literally, she had said, I'm going to do this. She, she thought it would be a way for her to be able to sort of experience life in a rich sensation 
And uh, to me, this was hilarious. And I said, well, how did it turn out? And she just laughed. And she's a brilliant, smart person. You know, she said, it's been, I've just been, it's been terrible. I've been just stressed the whole time. <laughs> And uh, of course, that is predictable, isn't it? Isn't that just, it's just arithmetic. If you try to do it all, if you just think you have to do it all, then you will, of course, predictably be stressed trying to be pulled in a million different directions. And so, uh, although we tend not to be as extreme or deliberate about it as that, uh, I think a lot of us are pulled up in that logic. I have to do it all. An essentialist simply says, look, it's about choice. And it's not just an intellectual understanding that they have. It's not just, well, you know, we always have a choice. And we can all say that, pay lip service to it. Essentialists, they feel it. I do not have to do this. I really choose. And therefore, I'm going to choose to live very deliberately. I'm going to be incredibly selective about the things I commit to uh, and, and thoughtful about the way I give so that I can contribute at the highest level. Mm. Very good. Well, next, Greg says, is this three-step process to, number one, explore your options. There is a part, a section of the book dedicated to that. Eliminating the trivial, another section dedicated to that, and executing the vital. Starting with explore, Greg, there, there's a paradox that we need to understand, isn't there? It's a very important paradox because often uh, when people think about essentialism, they jump to step two, which is this a memorable, in a sense, idea that you uh, have to eliminate the non-essential and s- people start thinking about it saying no, but it isn't. The first discipline of essentialism is exploration. So essentialists actually explore more options than a non-essentialist will. Mm. And this is why. A non-essentialist jumps right from idea to commitment right now. So they suddenly come up with an idea, in fact, this true story, an executive on the way to work listening to a podcast about ergonomically sound keyboards and he thinks this is really interesting and so he just jumps immediately into commitment. The staff meeting he has that he jumps into next, he spends 45 minutes of this one weekly meeting that he has with his top executives specifically on ergonomically sound keyboards. This is the whole obsession of the moment. And of course, this is not even close to what the top priority is that he ought to be talking about. Uh, but suddenly he's obsessed with it. And this is the problem, is when we just go big on every new idea, we just react to every new thing that comes along. Maybe it's not ergonomically sound keyboards, but it's the latest email, it's the latest fire, and suddenly we're just big on that issue. Mm. Instead of an essentialist is saying, okay, I'm going to go small on lots and lots of things, listening, observing, trying to work out what the thing is I really should go big on. Uh, So this is Thomas uh, Friedman, who I uh, interviewed um, in China, and he just had a lunch uh, with 16 people, and he appeared, according to someone at the table, to not really be listening. Uh, But in fact, what he was doing was he was listening very broadly, and then all of a sudden, when he heard someone say something surprising, something that, that seemed like there was news or a story or an angle there, he would suddenly jump on it and ask them lots of questions and go deep on this. In this way, he was listening to a broad conversation and then discovering what was actually essential and going deep on it. That, I think, is literally something we can do, but also metaphorically what we should be doing in our lives as well. Well, sticking with that, what are some of the other steps that we can take to, Greg, as you say in the book, discern the trivial many from the the vital few? Can you break that down for us a little bit? Well, I just had an email from um, Enrique Sala, who is someone who I think of as having applied essentialism uh, quite deeply to his, uh, his career. Uh, so he went from uh, being a professor at the Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography here in California. He, he realized that's good, but not great. It's not the very thing I ought to be doing. What he really wanted to do is be at National Geographic as an explorer. Well, he got to National Geographic, made a big shift in his career path to get there. He became more selective so that he was really focused on the very best use of him. He gets there, spends two years, actually pulled into something, again, good, but not the very thing he really wanted to be doing. So he was doing research for them with a research group. But he said, no, I really think I'm best used as an actual explorer. So he renegotiates there. He challenges, again, what he was being expected to do so he could be used even better. He ends up as an explorer in residence 
for National Geographic. He mm-hmm. travels all over the world. Uh, he is building, he, basically, he's creating national parks in the oceans and holding world leaders to account, and he's doing it successfully. Okay, but I've got to give you one more piece of this story because I've written about that in Harvard Business Review uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Well, he emails me just last week to give me the update to his story. So uh, I, I didn't know anything about this until I got the email. So he was recently diagnosed with cancer of the kidney. Mm. And all of a sudden, this whole conversation about essentialism, which he'd applied, I think, very effectively and over time to his career, suddenly went deeper. And he said, hold on, what if I really don't have much time left at all? And he asked himself a series of questions. One, what would I do if I had one week left to live? What would I do if I had one month left to live, a year left to live, five years left to live, and then finally, if I actually end up with a whole life left to live, what will I do? And he wrote answers to that, those questions. To me, this here, that I think is even, you know, just a one-hour ex- exercise that any of us could do, uh, could be the most important hour of our life in a sense because it can improve the quality of life for every other hour we have remaining. For him, this cut out so much of the fog of our daily lives. You know, the emails we get in that just make us believe and feel that this thing is important because somebody's asking for it, when really the important thing is happening over here somewhere else. This is one exercise that I think cuts through a lot of the, uh, the trivial uh, fog that confuses us uh, in our daily life. Mm-hmm. So now we've identified the trivial many, but that's not enough. We have to actually eliminate them. And Greg says it's possible, it is possible to do this and not have the whole world yelling off with his head. (laughs) You can actually gain more respect, Greg says, from your colleagues, your clients and your peers, even your bosses. Really, how, how is that possible? Well, first of all, I'm not advocating that we simply say no to people. Uh, I'm not saying that we suddenly, uh, you know, stick it to people. Oh, I'm not interested. I mean, there's, there's no part of that in what I'm suggesting. Uh, but I am saying that if we explore thoughtfully, deeply, more deeply than the people who are asking things of us, including our bosses, then suddenly we go up the respect ladder and we become uh, more of a trusted advisor rather than just an order taker. And so one of the examples I uh, came across that I loved about this, we, we often think of Steve Jobs as someone who said no to, you know, a thousand things. So he could say yes to one thing that really mattered. And I think that actually is true at Apple. But what I love is the story of someone who said no to him mm. and somehow still gained respect. And this is Paul Rand who produced uh, the, the logo for Next when, Apple, when, when Steve had been kicked out of Apple mm. and was starting his, uh, his next venture. Uh, so when he does this, uh, you know, Steve gets Paul Rand to come in and, and, and gives him a set of you know, instructions. He says, Paul, I want you to give me a bunch of options of how, to, how this logo would look like and so on and so on. He talks all about what he wants. And Paul turns around to him and says, look, no, <laughs> um, I won't do that. He says, I will solve your problem for you and you will pay me. And you don't have to use it, but you will pay me. <laughs> and it really will be great. Mm. So what does he do? Steve says, actually, I am going to trust a person who's thought through this more deeply than I have and thought through my relationship with a, you know, with a client more deeply than I have. And he, he gave him the piece of work. It was $100,000, by the way. He brought that piece of work back to him. Steve described it as a jewel of a logo and said later of him, he said, Paul was the ultimate professional because he really had thought through my problem, what my solution needed to be, and didn't just take the orders from me. Uh, I hadn't even thought about it nearly as much as he had. This is the idea. Even with this story, it's a little bolder than I think people have to be on a day-to-day basis Mm -hmm. with everybody. Uh, But I think it, it speaks to this idea that essentialism means thinking more deeply about how we can really contribute and how we can really solve people's real problems, not just the thing they have reactively asked for. Uh, this, is, uh, this is part of the solution of essentialism. And part of that, too, I think, from, from my perspective, being somebody who is a, you know, a freelancer, if you will, I begin to pick and choose exactly those clients that I want to work with. 
Well, I think it's absolutely right. I mean, if, if somebody is a is a freelancer, if somebody's working for themselves, uh, there's a temptation to get pulled into a non-essentialist trap, which is just to say yes to anything that pays money. <laughs> uh, yes to anybody who says, come and do this piece of work. And in just this way, unintentionally, we get pulled into oblivion. <laughs> we get pulled into just you know, a general shop that can do sort of a bunch of things and not distinctive. Uh, in fact, this was another person that I interviewed for the book is uh, Nancy Duarte, who started uh, her venture, a sort of graphic design agency, really, and uh, unintentionally became a bit of everything. So very passionate about everything and realized that as a result, they had become a non-distinctive agency. When they started to look for what they really was the very best use of them, the highest point of contribution, they found it was creating presentations of all things. So most graphic design agencies run from that work. It's the least thing that they want to be doing. But they said, we believe it can become its own craft, and they have become the premier company in the world at that thing. And so whenever people care about high-stakes presentations from all over the world, this is the company. She's now an expert in this field, does the TED Talks, does the Harvard Business Review articles on it, and so on. So it's a perfect example. She said that what was key for her was the moments that she said no to work. That was paid work, good work, but outside of this sweet spot that they'd identified. That was really the trigger to their breakthrough strategy. Well, now comes the the final of these three steps, execution. Is it really possible to make this step effortless, executing on, on on the vital few? And if so, Greg, how? Well, most often when we think about execution, it's almost like it has to be forced. We're going to make it happen. Mm. We're going to, you know, knuckles, uh, you know, tight, white knuckle effort to make it happen. And I think that this is just the wrong logic and it is born out of this non-essentialist nonsense of trying to do it all. And so because you've taken on too much, therefore, when you come to execution, you just have to make it happen, force it, do it, do both and so on. Uh, The alternative is if you are selective enough, what you can then do uh, in a disciplined way is build a routine around the things you've identified as most essential. And this removes a lot of the decision and decision fatigue that goes with it that happens in a given day so that we don't wake up and have to remake our schedule every day and rethink everything and when am I going to do this and when am I going to do that. It it means that you can build a routine uh, that supports the things that you want to accomplish. There's a a CEO in Silicon Valley who has, uh, has been incredibly successful uh, took $200,000 of his own money 35 or so years ago, started a company, didn't get venture back for, uh, you know, any funding, uh, used this, and has built it into $400 million business. Mm. Well, as I've really tried to understand how did he do it, the single thing that has been most impressive to me and most distinctive is that he has kept this incredibly disciplined routine every single day. And he gets up at a certain time, he goes to work at a certain time, he eats lunch at a certain time, he works the hardest thing first. The end thing, then the last thing he does every day at work is decide what the top hardest thing is, most important thing he needs to do tomorrow morning. Uh, it, it, it sounds so simple, and I'm not saying it's the whole explanation of success, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that it's something that's in our power to do, and it saves him so much energy from having to rethink these things every day so he can put his creative energies on the big problems that he's actually trying to solve. Greg, I want to ask you a couple of questions not directly related to the book. But before I do that, is there anything else you want to make sure we understand about essentialism, the book, before we move on? Well, I think the thing that I maybe would want to just say is that uh, just building on what we were just talking about is is this idea of the word priority itself. Uh, The word priority came to the English language in the 1400s, and it was singular. And it meant, just like I was talking about with the CEO, uh, the first thing. What's the hardest, most important first thing we need to do? This was the priority, the the prior thing. And it stayed singular for the next 400 years. Uh, Only in the 1900s did we pluralize the term and start speaking of priorities. But that is a term that really doesn't have a clear, good meaning. What do we mean by that? Many, many very first things, many, many things that are equally important. 
this is uh, this is not the way the world really works, and it's not helpful uh, for us simply to think it all has to be done. And so I think that this is the spirit of essentialism: is what's the priority now? What's important right now? And to focus on that. I'm so glad you brought that up. I remember reading that and was fascinated to learn the history of that word. I did not know that and intended to include a question along those lines. So thank you for doing my job for me when I left that out. (laughs) No, no, no problem. Uh, Greg, among all the leadership lessons that you've come to appreciate, if if you had to narrow the list down to uh, one theme or, or just a central idea, what advice would you impart? Leadership to me means inspiring people to become more of who they already are and less of who they aren't. Mm. Uh, That's true in self-leadership, in figuring out, look, what am I built to do? What did I come here to do? And not feeling this societal obligation to be all things to all people uh, and the nonsense that that produces in our lives as we try to be a bit of what everyone expects us to be. But it's also true for leading other people as well. When we're trying to force people to be what we think they need to be and then try to manipulate them into believing that that was really their own definition in the first place. (laughs) This kind of business bullying, really, (laughs) uh, is so counterproductive. I mean, this is why we then have to sort of carrot and stick people all the time and more forcing and manipulation. In fact, I had a fascinating conversation recently with a leader in a Silicon Valley company that you would know. And they said, you know, one of the reasons we don't train people on this really getting deep into who you really are and uh, and what you're really about is because when we've done it, they leave the company. Mm. I thought that was such an interesting moment of honesty about the problem. I mean, How ludicrous. Instead, we keep people in the company. They really aren't built to be there. This isn't really the best use of them, but we try to make it seem as if this is good enough and pleasant enough and and a good enough set of benefits uh, that you you can sort of trick them and keep them, uh, you know, off the actual path they should be on. Mm. I I think this is, uh, I think it's sort of shocking, other than the fact that I think it's true in many, many companies and for many people. Uh, so, So I think this simple idea... Uh, this leadership idea, self-leadership and leading other people, it's all about helping them to discover who they really are and to be more of that and to be less of who they really aren't. Well, regarding leadership, I want to encourage you to check out a book that Greg collaborated on called Multipliers with uh, Liz Weissman, who was a guest on episode 30 of the podcast. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, Greg, can you name for us a couple of books you've read or are currently reading that have had an impact on you and share how or why they've impacted you as they have? I've got um, three that I thought would be interesting to your readers. Okay. Uh, The first is actually an essay. Uh, It's not a well-known essay, but it's by Tennessee Williams. And he writes about it uh, after his script for The Glass Menagerie. Mm. And the essay is called The Catastrophe of Success. Uh, and, and I love this piece. It's just about his experience after having written The Glass Menagerie and how people responded to that and what it did to him and how it distracted him from the things that produced uh, the success in the first place. So I love that essay. I think that's very well, mm. well worth reading. Uh, the second is, is a book, it's called The Hour Between Dog and Wolf, and it's, uh, it's by John Coates. And this is, this is a fascinating book. You've never read anything like this. Mm. Th- this book is about someone who used to be a Wall Street trader, but is now a, um, a biologist. And so he explains the human dynamics that are going on in these fluctuations in the market and how it's really a biological problem that we're witnessing. Uh, not just an inherent instability in in money. Uh, and he makes this observation that uh, that so often we have tried to study Wall Street uh, as if it's an Excel document uh, mm-hmm. without actually studying the people behind the decisions. He says it's like studying a school without studying children and teachers. Mm. So this is a powerful explanation of what is happening when we get into the undisciplined pursuit of more periods. Uh, I think that's well worth reading. Mm. And, and finally... Uh, a book called Wake uh, by Frank Partnoy. Uh, the subtitle of that is The Art and Science of Delay. 
And, and basically, he goes through all the uh, ways in which we can make decisions more slowly and still end up with better results. And he starts with sort of uh, tiny millisecond decisions and goes all the way to the long-term sort of strategic big decisions. Uh, but his whole man- his argument is that in almost all cases, we need to wait to the last moment that's wise uh, to be able to make a decision and we'll make better decisions, that we show restraint, not to just this excessive uh, you know, pursuit of what we want right now. So anyway, those are three books that have been interesting to me. Excellent. Well, I know the book just came out, but that probably means it's been finished for a little while. Uh, so I want to ask, what's next on the horizon for you, Greg? What are you working on uh, that you're excited about or willing to share? I- I'll tell you that the one of the things I'm not doing is I'm not just jumping on the next book. I, I mm-hmm. have, I have, I think almost certainly what the next book will be, uh, but I just am not feeling uh, this desire to just do another book for the sake of it. In lots of ways, it would be the easiest thing to do. Mm. Um, and there is a demand to do that right now. The essentialism from a, an instant New York Times bestseller, it's done very well, it continues to do well, but there's a market for, for the next thing. Uh, but what I really am interested in doing is helping people to go deeper into essentialism. Uh, and so we're doing uh, the first webinars now on this, the first workshops on it, uh, and uh, and the response to that has been has been electric, uh, and so and so I'm really just interested in helping people uh, to apply this in a way that's meaningful uh, and makes a change. Well, I have to say, the more I read the book, the more appreciative I became that this conversation happened at all. <laughs> that it mm. th- that it didn't end up in the uh, trivial mini category. So thank you for <laughs> for uh, putting us in the vital few category. I appreciate it. Thank you ever so much for having me, and thank you for what you're doing. What you're doing matters, and uh, people people really do need to read more deeply. There's a, there's a rush not to do that these days, mm. to, to read only at the surface. So I appreciate the whole, the whole orientation and, and mission of the work that you're doing. I absolutely loved this book, and it is well worth your time. If you'd like to network with Greg, one of the best ways to do that is indeed on Twitter. He's at Gregory McEwen on Twitter. That's M-C-K-E-O-W-N, at Gregory McEwen on Twitter. And the Read to Lead podcast, as always, makes a great conversation starter. Anything you'd want to dive into more deeply after hearing today's conversation can likely be found at the show notes page. It's a page on our website created especially for this episode. You'll find that at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 052 for episode 52. Remember our sponsor Blinkist saved 20% on an annual subscription when you use the discount code READ to lead. Read to lead podcast.com slash Blinkist for more info. If you like what we're doing here and you haven't already, will you consider rating the podcast and reviewing it in either iTunes or Stitcher? We would greatly appreciate it. If you give it a five-star rating and leave a review with your name so we know who you are, we'll be sure and mention you by name in an upcoming episode is our way to say thanks. To rate and review the podcast, just visit readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes or readtoleadpodcast.com slash Stitcher helps get the podcast noticed and get the word out. We appreciate that very, very much. Well, that's going to do it for this week. I hope to see you next time for the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com and chat with other members at facebook.com slash readtoleadnation. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Every breath you take, every move you make, every bond you break, every step you take, I'll be watching you. Every single day, every word you say, every game you play, every night you stay, I'll be watching you. Oh, can't you see, you belong to me, how my poor heart aches. With every step you take 
Every move you make, every vow you break, every smile you fake, every claim you stake, I'll be watching.